three things that you should absolutely avoid and completely stop doing as a React developer. This will allow you to write better and easier code, avoid unexpected and weird bugs, and improve the performance of your application. So the first and the most important one of all of the actual bad stuff that you're probably doing and you should stop doing is conditional rendering. So conditional rendering is actually when using a Boolean variable and you actually include that variable inside of a GSX to basically tell whether that particular GSX should render or not depending on the Boolean's value. I know many of us developers, me included, I've used this for many, many years and many times and applications and stuff. But of course, most of the times this will be fine and this will be safe and work absolutely fine because it won't actually have issues when you know exactly that the variable you're using in here is an actual Boolean and a not different type. So in our case in here, we have this hard coded, but imagine yourself using JavaScript and you're fetching this from an API, or maybe you're doing some logic kind of, you know, you're putting a bunch of variables with the logic and doing some calculations and you want to just like return a variable, which is going to end up a Boolean and it should end up a Boolean and you want to use that boolean variable for conditional rendering in that case that would be fine but the problem is we don't know if the code is actually going to output an actual boolean or maybe there will be a bug or a weird behavior that's going to output something else like a number so if you look at the example this is what actually shows it shows only the winners users because we got the first variable is being like put it's true which means you're going to render the first one in here which we're only going to be rendering this portion and this portion here is not going to be rendered and in javascript when this evaluates to false it won't actually go ahead and evaluate the rest so what you're doing is actually saying here, if this is false, don't actually continue and do the other half of the end percent. But if this is actually true, go and actually execute the second part of the end operation. And let's say, for example, this showing variable isn't a Boolean for some reason, there is a bug happened. And now we ended up with another variable, maybe a zero, a real number. And we all know zero actually is the same as false. But JavaScript can treat that a little bit differently than compared to other programming language as we all know, because JavaScript is a bit more weird. So showing in here is zero, and I'm putting if zero, and, and, and we know this is zero, right, but this will go ahead and render this one regardless, because actually, when we have a zero in here, this zero is basically the same as like, null or the same as undefined, right. So that will give it the chance to actually check, oh, this is zero, it will just go ahead and output zero because zero won't be evaluated to true regardless. So it won't execute the second part, this won't be rendered anyway, but the zero is going to be displayed in the UI regardless. And obviously, when you look at this, you're going to get the zero and you're going to get the second expression because the second expression with the negation is going to work fine. Now here to make this work properly, you need to include a double negation. And that will give it actually a chance and that will just not display the zero because now it's actually evaluating this expression, this zero expression into a Boolean using the double negation. So if you real quickly try this on the console in here, and from like the you put a zero and you put like a console.log in JavaScript, that will output a zero and it won't execute the console log, but regardless of anything, it will still display the zero. So I would rather avoid this and completely change this into something a little bit more advanced. And that one is actually using the ternary operator. And what I mean by the ternary operator is when for example, doing show win in, and you use a question mark saying, Oh, if showing is true, go ahead and do this, which means it's going to like return this, it's going to render that one. Else, if it's not true, do something else. And for you on obviously react, you always want to do null for the like the else kind of like operator in here, which means if it's not like true, and it won't render the UI or render null, and it will cause no issues at all. Now, of course, I'm going to change this to real quick, like, not show sure winning and this this basically would work every single time at any party once at anything and you can even do this for example if it's a string or something you can do an equal sign you can manage it however you want and the code is a lot much more readable and easier to follow than before. So I'm going to put null in here. And that should work fine. Now if I jump back, you remember that's a string and everything that's working. And if I go back, for example, here, change this to zero, go back, that's zeros because zero now is evaluated to false, and I'm not being seen any zeros on top in here, and it won't cause any issues. The second mistake that you should absolutely avoid is not using debouncing. 
Now, what I mean by debouncing? Now, if you look real quickly to the Lotus documentation, it has a function called debounce. And the debouncing here actually means it creates a debounce function that delays invoking function until after wait more seconds have elapsed since the last time it has debounced the function was invoked. And this is a very important one. I really advise you to go ahead and look at this, especially the debounce one from Lodash in here. It's, it's a really nice one. But this what it does basically just like delays a particular function or delays the invocation of that function for a particular milliseconds you provide and it will only invoke that function since the last time that function was invoked. So for example, if you get two debounced that gets called one after the other before the milliseconds like of the first one gets called, the first one will be canceled. And from a blog post on Reddit about debouncing, so debouncing is a programming pattern or a technique to particularly restrict the calling of a time consuming function frequently. In our example, most of the times in web development is going to be an API. So it actually this one is basically going to delay the execution of a function until specified time Time to avoid unnecessary CPU cycles or or and the API calls to improve performance. So let's say you got, for example, a search bar with like a list of users or products or anything, or particularly items you're gonna like display and fetch from the API. Now we got like a bunch of users in here, and I want to do a search. And particularly, I want to do instant search, which means as soon as I type anything, an API call is going to go ahead and like be dispatched and it's going to like fetch the new users depending on what I typed. So on every single keystroke, on every single character, I'm going to go ahead and invoke and send an API request, which is super bad because this could actually go ahead and ruin the whole application and could make it absolutely bad in performance and can drown your servers with thousands of requests, especially if you have a huge community or a huge user space. So in this case here, for example, I'm going to go and do search, for example, Tiro, uh, something in here, as you see, there is a bunch of them. So every single one of these, you can see like search with a T, then a TE, then a TER. So every single character there has been like a request made for that particular character. So if I have a very long name in here, like if I add uh, hills or something, I'm going to get everything like hills is going to be there. It's crazy, right? To have that many requests just for searching a simple name in here. And imagine you have a huge user's base. Now, likely for us, debouncing can save the day. Now, let's first see how we're actually working with it right now or how it's actually working right over here. So, for example, I'm doing the handle search input. I'm changing the value in here. I'm sending the value every single time there is an unchange on our search bar in here. So, on change, I'm just doing handle search input. So, we got the value in here. So, we have value and set value. And that's it. I'm gonna have users of obviously in here. And here, this is actually the one that searches for users and actually updates the state by setting the new users. And for the search itself, I'm actually using a use effect. So every single time the value changes, I'm actually triggering the search users. And that's it. And obviously, this value is going to change on every single keystroke. That means this search users API is going to be called on every single keystroke and every single character. So how can debouncing can actually save the day for us? Now imagine I created this hook, it's called use debounce. And this is basically what it does, it just debounces a particular value and doesn't allow it to update until that particular delay or milliseconds wait time is fully elapsed. So I got this particular state in here, I've got sit debounce value, debounce value, and I'm using a simple use effect. So every single time I'm setting like every single time the value changes, the value I'm expect, accepting in here from uh, particularly the parameters in here. And what I'm doing in here is simply I'm putting a set timeout and every single like particular delay I'm just providing in here. So let's say this one is 300 millisecond. So before three millisecond is actually elapsed, I won't update this set debounce value. That means this values won't be updated. That means it won't actually update any Anything and it won't trigger anything at all. And obviously, every single time this value changes before the previous set timeout has been triggered or invoked, it will completely disregard the previous one and will completely remove the first, like, cancel the previous one and it will start over and that will make it work absolutely fine. Now, if I go ahead in here, actually go and test this out, I'm going to go and use my use debounce. I'm providing 300, I would suggest going for like 300, 500, and eventually I'm going to get the debounce value. Now on the debounce value, I'm going to comment this one because I don't need it. And I'm going to do a second use effect. So this use effect in here is going to have to search e users every single time this debounce value is going to change. And that value won't change a lot, particularly when we are actually typing, it will only change when we stop 
stop typing. So for example, if I search on something in here, I can do cherry. As you see, there is only a single request has been made and it got a response. It was working fine. And it's not being sending a particular or like a bunch of API requests on every single keystroke on every single character. That's a lot better. And the very bad mistake that you would probably fall on and get tricked because I know a lot of people would already know about the forward props kind of technique to pass props from like a parent component in here into a child component, like a custom child component. So where you pass refs and use that. But I still see so many developers, so many newbie developers particularly falling through with this trick and not exactly knowing where to go or what to do or what do you mean by forwarding props. So if you take this, for example, I got this component and I'm using the input ref name, using use ref normally without any issues. And I have a custom input component. And I mean it, this is not like a regular input tag. This is a custom component. This custom component is right over here. So here, I imagine I'm extracting the ref from the props. And I try to pass the refs into the actual input, the HTML input element in here, so I can access this ref in here. But this, unfortunately, it won't work as you would imagine, because in here, I'm passing refs and refs in here won't be taken care of by the component itself. And obviously, in the ref in here, I can do a bunch of stuff like input ref, I can go in and do a focus, or I can go in and do a select, and I got like a couple of buttons to do that. For example, I got like focus, and this should go ahead and use the ref to actually access the underlining input elements and actually focus on that elements. Or maybe you want to select all the text on that, but both of these are not working. And if you look at the console from the right hand side in here, you're going to know react is warning you about using the react for react. So simply to make that work, you need to go ahead and like go to your custom component in here that needs refs. And you want to wrap this up with react forward ref, right? And this will take a, like a callback thing. First thing it's going to give you the props. And the second argument is going to be the actual ref that's going to be passed through to this component itself. And this will be a callback as well. So that means I'm going to copy this one, I'm going to delete. And that is it. It's the same thing in here, just going to return a function, you're going to be able to render properly, no issues. Now, no need for the ref extracted from the props anymore in here. Like, it's we don't need it because now we got the ref from the for the ref prop. And this should work absolutely fine. Now, if I go back in here, I don't need to change anything at all, this will work absolutely fine. And you would have any issues if I go back in here and try to focus, it works, I can focus and if it can type time gibberish and it selects all this will work as well. That means ref now is actually working fine. So without further ado, guys, thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed catch you hopefully in the next one.